Hi, listeners. Quick message before this episode begins. Please check out the City of COS on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, sharing city news and events. We hope you'll follow along. Now it's time for Behind the Springs. I'm Jen Schrader, and this is Behind the Springs, conversations with the people working for you in Colorado Springs, Olympic City, USA. Hey, everyone. I'm Jen Schrader, and we love talking about what's happening right now in Colorado Springs on this podcast, but we also value our history, and we're lucky enough to have an entire division within the city team called Cultural Services, which focuses on that history. So as part of our Parks Department, our Cultural Services division includes the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. If you've never visited, I'm very disappointed in you. No, I'm just (laughs) kidding. If you've never visited, I highly recommend it. Um, It's free, although they'll always accept your donations. And you're bound to learn something new about the Pikes Peak region. So I hope that will be the case today on this episode. I'm welcoming two guests. Meg Yavara is the program coordinator at the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum. Thanks for being here, Meg. Thanks for having me. And Rhonda goodman Gagan is the assistant director and curator at the UCCS Heller Center for Arts and Humanities and one of the presenters during this lecture series happening right now at the museum. Welcome, Rhonda. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you both. So Meg, start by telling our listeners a little bit about the museum and the lecture series, because some folks probably don't know anything about it. Yes. So the Colorado Springs Pioneers Museum, um, we are your local history museum. We're free. We're open to the public Tuesdays through Saturdays, 10 to 5 p.m. And we tell so many different community stories. Uh, Really, our goal is museum is mirror. So we want you to come in, explore exhibits and see your story to feel connected to local history um, through the different exhibits that we present. In addition to the exhibits, we have a ton of programs. Uh, Right now, actually, we have a bunch of preschoolers over at the museum participating in our Little Learners series. And of course, we work with elementary students, high school students, all the way up through an adult audience. So programs for everyone, uh, trivia nights, lecture series, you name it. Our goal is really to be accessible to all. And it's also one of those great places that every time you come, it's a little different. The exhibits are changing, the programs are changing. So if people have been, but it's just been a while, Go back. Exactly. I know we have folks that, you know, it's been 10, 20 years since they've come and they say it's a totally different place. So even one year, two years makes a difference. Yes, that's for sure. So the lecture series, um, let's talk a little bit about that. And Rhonda, we're focusing at least today on one particular lecture coming up this very weekend. So hopefully people will attend. But either way, will you give us a little sneak peek overview oh, at this really interesting I'm person. very excited to talk about this, um, and I want to thank the Pioneers Museum for inviting me to speak on this. Uh, my lecture, which will be the first this Saturday, is on Dorothy Camp Heller, who was one of the first women to work for the Colorado Springs Police Department. She worked there from about the 1930s through the mid-1960s, and she focused on what was considered at that time women's work or women's issues, so domestic abuse, child abuse, and juveniles at risk. So what year was she with the department? Let's see, or she when? started in, <clears throat> excuse me, in 1934. She was okay. about 28, 29 years old. And then she worked until shortly before her 60th birthday in 1965. Oh my goodness. Okay. So she was there for a pretty good chunk of time. When not many other women were there. Not very many other women were there. She was, in fact, she was not considered a policewoman. She never went through the training, and she never took the oath of a police officer. She was considered a social investigator, and she was not, she did not report directly to the police chief. She reported to the city manager at the time. Got it. Okay, so she wasn't sworn, as we would say today. She was not sworn in today, no. And that did not happen during her time. Okay. So that, the first woman to be, um, allowed to take the oath of a police officer or sworn in was a year later after she retired in 1966. But this woman probably helped pave the way for yes. that. Yes, oh, absolutely. I mean, the work that she did is just incredible, dealing with um, domestic violence. I mean, nationally, the federal law um, prohibited wife beating around the 1920s, but it still took time for culturally to people get with the with the program. Mm-hmm. And even then they still considered it a woman's issue more than anything else. So they hired women pretty much from the beginning to take care of these certain types of issues, particularly with women and children. And that's what Dorothy did. Dorothy did some amazing work. She went undercover to get women out of situations. She 
um, over time started participating on panels and whatnot because the increase of incidents just started rising over time as Colorado Springs population sort of increased over time, so did the issues. And she was very much sensitive and plugged into that. And hopefully helped people start reporting it, right? Because yes, so it was so underreported. Yes. yes. I mean, to that extent. I mean, and we don't have accurate numbers. I mean, even then, in my research, I found direct quotes were saying, oh, we didn't care much to keep records of that. Mm -hmm. I mean, so it's just... A different time. A different time. And there had to have been plenty of times over her career when she had to go to the police chief and say, oh, you know, this would be so much easier if I was an actual officer. And I guess for whatever moment in that time, it just could not happen for her. And by the time it did, she and a lot of her women of her generation just had aged out. I mean, mm -hmm. 59 back in the 60s was considered up there. I mean, now, shoot, 59 is life 2.0 for us. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> but right. for them, at that period of time, I mean, you might as well just hang it up. And it's really unfortunate. I mean, this woman was from, from people who knew her just around town because she was born in 1905 and she died in 1999. So there's a lot of people around who knew this woman and the way they talk about her with such reverence and with just such respect, they're just, I have no doubt in my mind that had she been born maybe 20, 30 years later, she would have ran the police department. Right, okay. right. So what, what brought you, what got you interested in this and why are you our presenter on this particular lecture? Oh, well, let's see. I am the curator and the assistant director for the Heller Center for Arts and Humanities. And I think what I find very interesting about this whole Storthy story is that if it weren't for her second bequest to the UCCS, the University of Colorado, Colorado Springs, you may not know about this history of her work. She, When she passed, she donated um, her property, which consisted of 34 acres um, of open space preserve, um, three historic structures, Pueblo revival structures and a large amount of art and historical collections to the University of Colorado of Colorado Springs. Oh my and gosh, yes, that's amazing. It's a property that she owned with her husband, Larry Heller, who was a well-known artist in the area back in the mid 20th century. And in fact, when we talk about the Heller Center, it's usually his work that gets all of the notice. So Typical. No, I'm just, I'm teasing. <laughs> but his, no, his no, work is true. notable as well. His yes. His work is notable as well. And so it's really nice to just stand Shine back a light. and stand the light on her and her efforts. And when she donated the property to the university, she had the idea of creating a lab for the arts, humanities, and social sciences. So she named all these different departments that she, or what was what would be considered subjects in her day that have we have now sort of, you know, pulled together. And I work with um, a number of academic departments at the university to put together programs and whatnot. But it's nice to a, just sit back and say, you know, aside from her don't her bequest to the university, she did quite a bit of work herself, and she made quite an impact on the city, too. And yes, I would imagine, I would agree that her work pretty much led to that, you know, the, you know, the city finally coming to their senses and saying, okay, you know what, we really need to make women off. Now. Right, right, right. It, it always takes somebody. Yeah, to get, it always takes somebody. Yes, and, and, and it's one of the reasons why I call it the quiet impact of yeah. Dorothy Heller. I mean, she's not exactly a hidden figure because that's a big name word term these days. Mm -hmm. You know, bringing people to life whose contributions have been completely right. She's submerged. not completely unknown. She's not completely unknown. Okay, but in quiet in that. You know, you know about this bequest she gave to the university because it's right there. Um, but you, when you have to dig a little further to find, and it's like her work is almost like a whisper right. in Colorado mm -hmm. Springs history. And I'm just like, no, actually, this woman was a big, you know. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm going to shout it. <laughs> yes, exactly. From the rooftops. Or from Eagle Rock, because, you know, Pulpit Rock, because we're right. <laughs> the that's property right. property is pretty much right there. Oh, is it? Oh, yes. that's really neat. Yes. Well, it sounds like a power couple, too. Yes. Really yes. a remarkable couple. Yes. Um, so tell us a little bit about, and may, maybe this is you more, where, when people, how can they sign up to see this particular lecture? Yes. And then if they miss this one for some reason, there's more to come. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So the lecture is this Saturday, uh, January 21st. Our lectures are always held on Saturdays at 2 p.m., typically the second Saturday, but we thought we'd give people a little bit more time after the holidays and right. readjusting to the new year. Um, so yeah, so this Saturday, you can visit our website, cspm.org forward slash lecture series, and that's where you can register and also see the full list of upcoming programs. We have a really exciting 
exciting series planned. Um, we actually have a lecture series committee of local community members that come together to help us pick these topics. I was so, going to ask how yeah, you choose. It must be difficult sometimes. It's really, really difficult. Um, but for example, John Harner, who serves on our board and also works at UCCS, uh, made the connection for us with Rhonda. We've known Rhonda and we have lots of great connections, but uh, he offered her or suggested her as a potential presenter and she was up for it. So thank goodness. Um, yeah. Thank goodness. We've, yes. and, and again, having those community members that can help build connections and, and bring different names and ideas to the table has been a huge asset for us. That's so, really good. A lot and of exciting things coming up. Yes. And so tell us a little bit about, you hinted at it, but what are some other programs you offer, um, you know, just for people listening and thinking, oh, I might want to do the lecture series. I might want to do something else. Of course, you can just come and explore the museum on your own. Right. Um, but there are many other ways to yeah, experience. Exactly. So the lecture series, of course, is a, a very scholarly, academic approach. You can sit and learn. There's always great images and photo, you know, um, PowerPoint presentations that go along with those. If that's not your style, um, we do things like trivia nights. Mm -hmm. So we're planning one for April 2023, and that's a great evening program. It's like bar-style trivia where you come out, you have a team, you get asked questions, uh, but we mix it up. We incorporate exhibits and artifacts to make it a little more connected to the work we do. Um, if you have kiddos, we have a ton of family-friendly programs. Little Learners, History Detectives are our monthly series, and lots of family fun days, just big festivals. Yeah, I was going to say offer. throughout the year. Yeah, yeah, which is, I remember many years ago how I discovered you all was through the Festival of Lights Parade. Yes. And <laughs> how you, you know, brought the kids in to make ornaments, and why haven't I been here? And I think a lot of people just drive by it or walk by it and don't even think to go inside. Exactly. So go yeah. inside. <laughs> come, please come inside. Please come on in. <laughs> There's so please much come to on see in. do. <laughs> okay. So one last question for you both. Um, would love to know how you each got in, interested in history and sort of what propelled you onto the path that you find yourself on now. You want to take it first, Rhonda? Sure. I okay. Mean, I've worked at several historic houses. Um, okay. I would say most notably, I worked for a couple of historic houses from the National Trust for Historic Preservation in Virginia. Okay. Um, a Frank Lloyd Wright house, um, Pope Leahy, and Woodlawn, which is a plantation that was once part of Mount Vernon. Oh, yes. And um, became sliced off and be was a wedding present for Nellie um, Lewis. And so, yeah, she's the woman, that, that that famous picture of the Washington family portrait, that young woman in the back, that's Nellie. I worked oh, wow. at her house. I was um, director of education there for a couple of years, many, many years ago. <laughs> and um, I will say that one of the things I, I like about history and I like about local history is that how it, how you can take national events and big regional events and see how it applies at a local level. And it, it lets us know that, you know, these, how these big issues impact us on a local level, but with a regional flavor to it. I mean, certain things. So when I take it back to Dorothy Heller, of course, women all across the mid-20th century were trying to push into fields that were not commonly for women back then. But then to see how that looks like here in Colorado Springs and how one woman you know, forged ahead. This is one of the reasons why I love local history. And it just matters more matters to people, more, yes. right? Because it's like, how does it affect me? Which right. is what we ask no matter what we're learning about. Exactly. And to know that there is a woman who pretty much lived in your area who sort of paved a path for you may make you braver to chart your own course, even if it's in a completely different field. Right. Yes. Definitely. It's inspirational. Yes. So are you from Virginia originally or no, where? I am not. I am from Kansas City, Missouri. Oh, okay. So you've just been all over. <laughs> I've been everywhere. Yes. Oh, that's great. Well, we're glad you're here. Thank you. <laughs> and what about you, Meg? What got you hooked? On... I love that. The, the looking at national history through a local lens. I think that's the work we try to do every day. So that's great to hear. Um, me, history. Let's see here. So I studied anthropology at Colorado College and was set to be become an archaeologist. Oh. Um, just have always been fascinated with the past and what we can learn from objects. I'm really interested in artifacts and the stories they tell. Um, and just through a series of experiences, internships, jobs at museums, um, found that this was really my passion. 
Um, I really, you know, there's behind the scenes museum work where you're working with collection objects, our registrar, Caitlin Sharp, Hillary Mannion's our archivist, and they get to kind of go through the boxes of photos and books and objects. And, and where I really find that connection is through sharing that history. So I like them to do kind of the behind the scenes work and teach me about it and do all that fabulous work. And then being able to share um, to all ages this passion and, and find. And then you say, we got to take these art artifacts and bring them to the kids yeah. or bring them to trivia night. Exactly. Yeah. Like let's touch these things. Let's make meaningful connections. Let's, so it's kind of that, that added layer, um, that it just really makes me excited about the past. So exactly. that's wonderful. And I love the way you can take some, an innocuous object <laughs> and it just tells you so much more than perhaps what a text will ever tell you. Yes. yes. And so, yeah. And so don't you both think that that hands-on is really what gets especially the younger generation oh, totally. interested. And adults. Yes. I mean, yes. sometimes yeah. the books do it, but for a lot of kids, they really want to, they want the stories and they want the the pieces to see and to feel and touch. And We did a program with adults um, just a couple days ago and just put a bunch, we have a museum use collection, which are objects that can be used in an education setting. Mm -hmm. um, and just pass them around and ask questions and the stories they started to tell, oh, I grew up using this. or I remember mm -hmm. my grandma had one of these. <laughs> um, so regardless of your so age. So even the grown ups, that's yeah, how you get them hooked. Like, you know, we learn better through the, the five senses. So, so yeah, it's just really cool to be able to bring that mm -hmm. to folks in the public. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, thanks for sharing so much about and Thank you. That was a good teaser. We're not going to tell you everything about Dorothy, right? Or we'll ruin it. So come. please yeah. come on Saturday if you can. And if you can't come to one of the future uh, lectures that are coming up. So uh, thank you both for your time. And I really want to let people know CSPM.org is a wonderful resource. Um, you can interact with the museum in all different ways, online, in person. There's just a lot of options. So check out their website, um, follow them on social media. And uh, did I say visit the museum? Yeah, <laughs> 10 visit times. the museum. I said it like <laughs> 10 times. Um, so any, as always, I'm grateful for our listeners and thank you for joining us for Behind the Springs. Have a great day, everybody. Hey.